Welcome back to ARC's BIS 2020 Q&A video conference. As Tom mentioned, I'm Brett Winton, ARC's Director of Research, and I'm joined by Jackie Rhesus. Uh, so Jackie, you've led Square Capital since 2015. Uh, if I went through your whole resume, it would take a long time, but before that you were at Yahoo uh, and spearheaded the, the um, Alibaba stake that Yahoo had. So um, quite a tumultuous, exciting career. Um, can you talk about what led you to Square in the first place and then how, and introduce kind of Square Capital, but also how has Square changed from 2015 to today? And is, is it expected or unexpected? What's happened yeah. from your point of view? A lot of good questions there. Um, what attracted me to Square was that it's a uniquely inventive company. And I think from a culture point of view and the dynamics of the executive team, it's a really enjoyable and intellectually challenging experience to be with people who I consider to be incredible inventors. And so that it, Square really feels like that from the inside out. I think additionally, I think it's a very well-run company because it's a company that can always look forward, acknowledge mistakes, uh, be reflective of those mistakes, and then continue to push forward. And so I think it's really exciting, particularly in the world of fintech, where there's not a well-laid path before you uh, to be in an environment that's endemically inventive. And so that's why I came um, and it's been fun ever since 2015. I joined right before the IPO, which was an amazing time to join. And, and you mentioned FinTech. It, it's, it seems like FinTech should have happened a few times already. Like during dot-com, you know, the banks were all supposed to be disrupted then, um, you know, after the financial crisis, kind of the financial ecosystem seemed like it was in such upheaval. That was the time that FinTech was going to kind of disrupt things, but it seems to actually be happening now. Like, why is it happening now? Why is Square having, getting the traction that it is, as well as kind of your, you know, competitors and, and, and like, what is it about this moment that you think opens up the competitive space? Yeah, well, interestingly, Square was started in the last recession and so, if you think about when um, when entrepreneurs step back can often be in times of absolute crisis where they're sitting in a consumer environment and a business environment where they feel intrinsically the pain of a set of customers and that pain point and that appreciation for what's happening and why a need isn't being met is the reason why a company can get started. And that was how Square got started. Uh, which was an appreciation for carrying around a supercomputer in your pocket, yet not being able to do a mobile transaction for a small business. And so that was the catalyst for Square. I think over the last 10 plus years, you've seen those businesses scale uh, to the point where they're now far more significant players in the economy. Having said that, even within the payments ecosystem, it's still a highly fragmented industry um, that's still largely dominated by legacy players. And so cloud-based systems are really still a very small part of the overall TAM uh, for that market. And so there's still so much opportunity uh, for fintech players to operate today. A lot of times people ask, well, you know, surely the incumbents see this occurring now. They have, and, and this is this is a question that happens to us across innovation. It's like they have essentially unlimited balance sheets um, you know, how have you seen kind of the competitive response to what you're doing and, and what prevents them from, from reacting to a disruptor like Square? You know, I, it depends where you're talking in the banking ecosystem. Like if I were to think about lending, banks start with an incredible advantage and you reference it, which is this balance sheet that they use. And frankly, they're valued based on the their ability to use their balance sheet cheat smartly. FinTech is very different. Um, FinTech is focused on the end, the end customer, the need, the problem that they're solving, the job that they're being hired for. And Square, for example, builds elegant, simple products in order to meet that need. We don't come at it from a balance sheet point of view. 
In fact, we typically abstract away all the value chain elements that a bank typically has from what our customer sees so that they only see how the product is delivered for their benefit, as opposed to the rest of the plumbing that sits underneath the banking ecosystem, which is how, how we all focus on piecing the product together to deliver it for our customer. And so I think culturally we come at these products from such different dimensions um, that it's a bit ships passing in the night. I suspect that will evolve very differently in the future as the boundaries between what's a bank and what's a fintech um, evolves. I think we're a perfect example of that. Um, we will own a bank in short order. Um, and so there will be a blurring, but I think the orientation and the way we think about invention might, might still remain very different between the two different types of companies. And specifically within capital, you know, I saw uh, a, actually a business owner was tweeting the other day that his best banking relationship is is with his credit card processor, uh, LOL. Uh, like, why should a credit card processor be able to allocate credit better than a bank, which has a long history and all kinds of processes in place for yeah. allocating credit? You know, what you're referencing has to be in relation to PPP. We, we participated in the Paycheck Protection Program and we received a lot of public feedback about the experience and how differentiated it was um, from traditional banks, even starting with the same guidelines and the same, the same start of the gun. I think the product looked very different from an orientation. Um, I think why should a, a credit card processor be in the, in the banking system? I kind of step back and say that Square is an ecosystem to support small businesses, start, run and grow their business. And so, I don't really think of us as a credit card processor. I think of us as a, a player that builds broader products to support customer needs. And if you think about where lending um, and Square Capital, because uh, I didn't mention it, uh, is a small business lender. We use machine learning to uh, facilitate loans to small businesses. Our average loan size is $7,000. So we look very different um, than many banks that have a million dollar average loan size. Um, we facilitated almost $7 billion of loans, 6.8 to be exact, uh, to 340,000 uh, small businesses across the United States. Um, I think there are a few dynamics that are happening today that make what we do interesting in the context of a payments ecosystem. Um, credit happens now in context. And that I think is the biggest driver of why lending should and can take place in a differentiated way with the advantages of the payments ecosystem. We have billions of data signals that come in every day into our system that allow us to facilitate loans to many businesses that have been unlocked using traditional means of credit. And so because of the way that we underwrite and actually operate in those signals, we can unlock access and we can aggregate data that enables us to have a better picture of a small business um, than many other underwriters can in tra using traditional means. So when you say like credit happens within content, you're basically alluding to the fact that having those distribution points then then allows you to, to kind of instantaneously be like, oh, it looks like you need working capital. Here's an opportunity for a working capital loan. So yeah, it, it, go um, on. It, so it's interesting. Um, payments data is current. It's very detailed and it provides a full picture of revenue. It's right in a point of sale system. So it's in context with where a small business does their business. And it enables small businesses to be in their own environment and have credit be available at their own fingertips. And so I think that's the future for how lending will happen, whether that's in payments, the way we operate, whether it's in payroll, also the way we operate, or even broader outside of Square on things like accounting and tax data. I think the context really matters for being able to facilitate underwriting uh, in a more organic setting. Got it. And, and, and does, your ability to kind of to to operate within that context is is the product space or the potential product space opened up to you 
because of the bank charter that you've just gotten? Or is, is like, does that give you more strategic flexibility in, in the kinds of products you offer? Or, or is it more of like a margins uh, accretion thing? Yeah, it's, um, there are a lot of reasons why we saw it an ILC charter. And an ILC charter is an industrial loan corporation. It's a bank that's chartered in Utah. And um, today we work with an ILC to facilitate capital loans. And so we have this one relationship which underpins the infrastructure uh, within capital. And so as we were looking forward as a very significant scaled player in the business, um, we saw a few strategic reasons why it was important for us to uh, secure our own charter. First is just controlling our own destiny. We obviously are very large. We wanted to be able to control the relationship with our regulators and make sure we had that direct relationship. We wanted to make sure that relationship lived and died off of our own successes. And so we weren't beholden to any bank, any other issues uh, related to our bank. The next piece of it that was interesting is that we also have a lot of products within Square that actually operate with bank partners. And so even though the charter started with capital and it's very significant for capital because it's what facilitates our loans, there are places over time where the charter can be applicable, um, both in terms of core lending and deposit products, but also across products that exist at Square today. Got it. it. It seems as if there is, I mean, you know, if you look at Square's entire portfolio of things that it offers, it, it's kind of duplicating the, the old bank, but maybe in a more humane way. You know, do, like there's an obvious inhumane product set out there, which is credit card, where people borrow, borrow by accident and they face your serious terms. Do, is Square Capital restricted to the to the small business space or, or is Square Capital going to be a consumer small business employee kind of across the entire company? So we focused on small businesses and um, we believe there's a huge opportunity to serve small businesses. If you think about what we do, our average loan size is seven thousand uh, dollars. It truly is a Main Street product and it's truly a market that is um, completely ignored by banks, both in terms of geography and it, where you have little businesses all across the United States and banking deserts where there no longer is a bank branch or even with regard to scale. And so there's so much space around providing credit in a more flexible way, even beyond what our core product looks, looks like. Um, you know, we started with a core flex loan. We've developed term loans, which are just fixed amounts over month. We also finance hardware that you could buy to onboard to Square. So we've made that process an easier process. Um, and then we'll broaden out to banking services with our bank. And so we're truly focused there. And, and um, you know, that'll that'll take us into the foreseeable future. Yeah. It, it seems like the um, the one of the unique things about Square and some of the other fintech players is is they have these uh, concentric ecosystems that overlap and and reinforce each other. Um, can you talk about kind of um, how the culture in Square enables that, and and also how innovation companies like yours have responded to the uncertain environment that they've seen, you know, over the last three months? Yeah. Um, I think culture in tech companies um, is the most important driver of invention. And I think it's truly what differentiates a lot of the very successful companies, whether they're officially called tech companies or not. And you have to look broadly at all the systems and infrastructure that you have in a company. And by that, I mean any element of um, both stated and unstated norms within a company around what, what is rewarded as success and what is rewarded as failure and whether a company can learn from its mistakes. And so in a company like Square, I think we're able to look forward and pay attention to hypotheses about the future and be willing to make bets on them and be wrong 
and potentially be rewarded for being wrong so long as we then understand where we could go and pivot in order to course adjust. And so we've been able to organically create new products. Cash App is a great example of an incredibly successful product, uh, which is getting a lot of attention uh, recently because of its success and some of the very cool features that it launched. And that was an organically built product. Square Capital came out of a Hack Week project where a series of engineers and product managers decided uh, on a two day project that they saw a need and they were gonna build it. But the beauty of a company like Square and the culture like Square is that someone was willing to say, that's pretty cool. I think we should fund that and actually put people behind it and then go experiment on it. And the people who sat in that early on we're not fearing for their career or their success if it didn't work. They were excited to work on something that was new and inventive and to try to figure out what was happening. And so that's what I mean by people are willing to experiment and make mistakes and pivot. Um, and so it's an important part of creating a culture and creating systems in place um, to enable that organically. And, and so then within the context of, you know, certainly the last, both both six months and three months, call it, you know, how how is that um, kind of culture reacted to kind of the, the series of, you know, acute events that we've had? And, and then within Square Capital, how have you managed the uncertainty, particularly on the credit side, but generally? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll focus for a minute on the pandemic because I think it touches, um, I think, to your credit question uh, where you're going. Um, one of the interesting elements of Square is that we were already focused on being a distributed workforce before uh, the end of February. And so from an orientation of a leadership team, we thought about how we were going to set up recruiting, hiring, onboarding, um, regular team management, time zone management, uh, team culture, technology so that we could build a company that could operate in any distributed fashion. And so that got amplified uh, with um, COVID-19. And we were one of the first companies to go work from home in the Valley. And so we had our bumps early in the road um, around, you know, how do you get equipment home? You know, we want to hardware development shop in San Francisco. And so our hardware team had unique experiences um, that, you know, they had to send equipment home to, um, you know, and figure out how to get it there. And, and so we had some very unexpected questions that we needed to solve. But having said that, we were able to do it pretty quickly and respond pretty quickly. And I would credit Jack for his foresight into appreciating and pushing us to make sure that we could su succeed at this even before uh, March hit. Um, and then on the credit side, um, uh, you know, one of the interesting dynamics of a lending business is that you have to understand how to underwrite. And underwrite, critical to underwriting is models or models that can predict the future. Well, when you have, external exogenous interventions that disrupt your typical modeling flow, it completely uh, eliminates your ability to underwrite in a safe and sound manner. And so we actually, uh, at the very beginning of March, took a moment of pause because we didn't know what we were underwriting at that particular moment. And so as soon as uh, we saw the trends uh, focused on shutdowns abroad, we started to spend time planning around how we would manage it in the United States. And we were uh, from a manual override about two weeks ahead of where we started to see all of the payments data change. Uh, and so we were very, on a day-to-day -day basis, we were watching the signals. And so we ended up pausing our models and proving to ourselves that uh, the combination of human judgment and watching the data, understanding the economic environment and the nature of our models got us well ahead of any challenges on risk. And so I think we were very lucky to be able to manage 
credit quality and volatility in advance of any significant problem. Having said that, I would expect credit quality to diminish in some of those um, cohorts of loans that were uh, last released prior to the shutdown. You can expect IRRs to be consistent when you have two months worth of a reduction in payments. Um, but we are seeing a significant change in trends after the reopening mid-April. And so it's been very, very encouraging to see um, uh, the data uh, subsequent to that complete shutdown and end of May, beginning of April. And did you have to like talk this through with your partner bank on the back end? I mean, they must have been concerned about the quality of the portfolio, right? I mean, that was that. Yeah. That um, so, um, you know, we spent a lot of time across the value chain and with our own team, making sure that we were taking in payment signals, as well as ops and support signals from our capital operations team. We spent a lot of time with our data science team and we ran daily standups uh, when we were watching changes abroad around this issue of um, this is the moment when we all need to be laser focused on any volatility and changes in credit quality. And so um, we started to meet internally daily and then in addition to that, we added other players in our value chain, like our bank partner and like our investors who buy our loans. And so we were very focused on making sure everyone had fully transparent data or as transparent as we could give them. And we really didn't hold anything back. You know, as we were seeing it, we would get on the phone with folks and make sure they understood what we were seeing. Yeah, it, it does seem as if um, kind of you and your ilk of fintech player, you have real time data. Like it seems like you have a liver look into the, the world as it's happening than others do. Um, it, yeah, I think it's um, it, the immediacy of it is really important um, and the depth of it is very important. And so, you know, signals like volatility and number of transactions. Um, concentration of customers, active days, you start to watch patterns of behavior that become concerning. And you can also see it in uh, different geographies, different size um, of company, different, um, uh, different types of environments like rural, suburban, urban. And so we watched all of it to see, you know, at first we were just watching for for overall patterns, whether there were places we could continue to underwrite and places where we couldn't. But as more and more governments, government, local governments were stepping in to make decisions about whether commerce could happen, it became obvious that we weren't able to participate in a forward-looking underwrite at all during those moments. The one challenging dynamic though is that decision sounded really smart and we were well ahead of the game with regard to managing risk um, versus data in the model and probably ahead of our, our many of our peers. But it's a really painful decision for people who want to deliver a service for sellers. And when they absolutely need the credit, we spent hours on the phone debating whether there was any way that we could keep credit open and how we do that for the better of our sellers. But because we had to focus on the long-term delivery of being able to provide credit, we had to manage all the players in that ecosystem, our sellers first, and we always start there, but we also had our bank partner, regulators, and it, and investors. And so with all of that, we were forced to pause and make that decision, even though, you know, I think from a seller point of view, I know we disappointed people. Um, and it's frankly, one of the reasons we pivoted so quickly to PPP, because we didn't want to disappoint our sellers and anything we could do to make sure they had access to credit, we absolutely wanted to deliver on, no matter how painful it was in the process. Right, right. And 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 it was interesting that that the fintech players got in uh, were eligible to participate in PPP, uh, and people had a great experience with it. Um, you're still on pause on the traditional credit product at this point, right? Or as of today, yeah, as of today. Um, uh, yes, we're we're trying to finish delivering PPP. 
mm-hmm. uh, and make sure that gets completed with forg- the forgiveness application out. And so uh, we're focused there um, first. Got it. Got it. So, you know, potentially forthcoming, but it, it it's a, has, has the modeling that you do fundamentally changed over the five years in like a profound way, or has it been a continuous series of improvements? Have there been like injections of new technology for credit modeling or, or is it? You know, um, interestingly, our models still do a great job of ranking volatility and the credit risk of merchants. And so I don't see us changing our underlying models because our data set is so large on small businesses we have a really good read on the underlying health of small businesses. And so I don't uh, foresee any changes to those models. I think to get us started, um, we would have to make some adjustments to those models because we have to deal with what just happened and making sure we're managing out that volatility uh, over the uh, mid-March to end of April time period. But beyond that, fundamentally, I don't see anything changes I, changing. I think the one benefit we have from this dynamic is that um, the blind spot we always had was that around an economic downturn. And I think we've just felt that in spades. And so as much as we ran every scenario for playing out a downturn, um, I think this will give us richer insight into um, how Uh, our models could be adjusted for future downturns going forward. And so I do think we'll have um, insights into variations in product structure that we could deploy. And I think we have more confidence in our ability to underwrite in turbulent times. Got it. Uh, In terms of the future, you have have a lot of, I mean, really fascinating experience. You're on the board of NPR, you're on the board of um, the the SPAC that became Virgin Galactic, uh, you know, can can you talk about both within fintech? What what do you see as the 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 major kind of um, th- not things to expect, but 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 changes that you would anticipate over the next five years, and then more broadly within kind of the economy and markets? Yeah, um, I uh, I you know I do think you've seen the evolution of how fintech has made banking services more intuitive. And you might not think of them as banking services uh, because you're interacting with them and the experience is elegant and beautiful. Um, but I think we, uh, you really have seen a, a significant evolution in those products proliferating on the consumer side. I think on the business side, they've been less forthcoming. And that's why I'm so excited about what we're doing. There's still a dearth of products that supports um, services for small businesses. And even though the Square ecosystem feels like a a wide berth of products between customer loyalty and our developers products and payroll and retail point of sale and restaurant point of sale um, and our invoices product and all the capital products around instant deposit, instant deposit lending. Um, there's still so much, so much space uh, to offer those services in the future. And um, you know, I mentioned where credit happens in context. I think um, businesses will start to see these products developed at their at their fingertips. Um, a few other points I, I touched on but didn't quite mention is that. Um, we also have seen data science become at the under uh, the underpinning of um, new systems that allow credit to open up to businesses that have never been served. And I think that aperture is finally widening to many who were perceived as too risky and have previously been un- been locked out of the financial system. Small does not mean uncreditworthy and new does not mean uncreditworthy. And I think we'll prove that to the world. And it's great to be a part of um, that process. I also think the aggregation of data will be very interesting because it'll give a new holistic picture of businesses that has never been perceived before. And so that enabled the delivery of new products. So I think with all of that, 
it will bring together financial products that are the right size and the right place in context for businesses versus searching for these piecemeal and silo products that have otherwise been challenging to get to credit, you know, credit reports and all kinds of um, personal guarantees and things like that in order to secure, even though they seemed like very basic products. Hmm. Do you think, I mean, I like the idea of credit happens within context. Doesn't investing also happen within context? Do you think that you could enable kind of your cash app ecosystem users to invest directly into the small businesses in some way in some kind of credit instrument? Is that a possible direction? you? Well, could I guess, um, you know, cash app is a very large, e large ecosystem of consumers. And so I would say broadly, of course they could invest in lots of different asset classes. I think fixed income is one of them. You know, if you think about credit to small businesses, it's a, it's a fixed income product to small businesses, whether there's a retail market or not. Um, you know, we focus on an institutional market versus a retail market. It's an easier market to scale, uh, which is why we focused on it. But you could absolutely see a world in which cash app customers or any financial, um, you know, ecosystem of consumers would want to invest in very strong, healthy returns in a fixed income product. Right. And so it absolutely makes makes tons of sense. Yeah, it's kind of if you think about like a loyalty program, it's kind of like you're investing in the business, right? This you could just directly invest or even during this crisis, the restaurant bonds where they sell off a gift card and then you get, you know, a discount when you actually use it. Seems like I like that. Fun. You want us to um, to create bonds for our small businesses. Would you like to invest in, you know, XYZ coffee shop in New York City, and we could aggregate coffee shops to create a to create a fixed income pool of uh, of urban coffee shops. I like that idea. I like exactly, that idea. exactly. And then you become an advocate for the business you're invested in. So it's a way to kind of stitch together the local community. You know, when we went public, um, one of the things we did was let sellers invest in Square, and it was such a wonderful moment to have this kind of shared belief and appreciation for wanting to see each other succeed. I love that. Um, it just made made me feel like we were all emotionally connected to each other. Um, but I like the fixed income idea. We'll, we'll uh, you know, we'll think about um, coffee shop bonds. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of product iteration that has to happen <laughs> before that ever <laughs> sees the light of day. Yes, that's it would require some operational execution, I think. Um, okay, I would be remiss if I didn't ask your opinion on Bitcoin. And is there any kind of way in which Square Capital will plug into that? Do you anticipate that any blockchain technology will appear on your product roadmap within kind of the capital employer side of the business? Going forward? Uh, right now, um, we have a Bitcoin product in Cash App. Uh, you could uh, buy Bitcoin in the app. It's a great experience. If you haven't used it, I highly suggest everyone use it. It's super easy. And I think it really democratizes and makes it super easy um, uh, to use. And you don't have to sign up for another app or you know send your penny back and forth in a different experience than the the peer to peer network that you're already a part of uh, with your cash tag. Um, you know, as it relates to lending, um, we don't really talk about what's on our roadmap. I think we'd have to see, you know, our sellers seeing it, seeing a demand there, and we'd want the experience to be a great one. And so, you know, today we're very focused on opening up Square Financial Services uh, come next March and making sure that we could deliver on our lending products and on de deposit products for small businesses. That's our that's our first priority even though I do think it's pretty cool to have a, uh, a Bitcoin lending product. Um, but I'd like to make sure we could deliver on our bank as well. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jackie, for your time and, um, and congratulations on, on, you know, running and spinning up a, a really incredible business uh, line in Square Capital. Uh, we're going to take a one minute break. Uh, when we come back, ARC's founder, CEO, and CIO, Kathy Wood, will interview Dr. Jennifer Doudna on everything from her co-discovery of CRISPR gene editing to the future of healthcare. Thank you. <laughs>